Thank you. Um, can everyone hear us okay? This is Sandra Inamel and Maria Scheid is here as well. Great. Um, so thank you very much um, for uh, joining us today and many thanks to the folks at ACRL for putting this together. Um, as I said, my name is Sandra Inamel. I'm the Copyright Services Librarian here at The Ohio State University Libraries. And I'm Maria Shai, and I'm Copyright Services Coordinator at Ohio State. And so our topic today is, our topic today is going to be understanding fair use through case law. And we're going to uh, walk through a few cases, obviously not all the cases um, that are, uh, exist in fair use in the United States, but we're gonna walk through a few of them just to illustrate some of the points under uh, fair use in which we wanted to um, basically help you get a better understanding of where fair use comes from and how, fair, and how case law supports fair use. Before we get started though, we have to give this disclaimer um, that even though we are talking about a legal topic, we are not providing legal advice to you uh, we're not serving as your legal counsel. So, you know, we might be lawyers, but we're not your lawyers. So, yeah, just wanted to make sure that that was, that disclaimer was put out there. And then thank you all again for participating with us during Fair Use Week. Um, for anybody who's not familiar, Fair Use Week happens every year, um, usually the last week of February. And so um, there are lots of activities and events happening um, around the country and in Canada for fair dealing. Um, so if you are interested, you can actually check out uh, ARL's, uh, um, ARL, ARL is host, host the website, uh, fairuseweek.org, that you can go and see other activities that are happening throughout the week. Here's our agenda of what we're going to be covering today. So before we could talk about fair use, we really have to do like a quick background on copyright um, to make sure everybody understands what's being covered. And then we're gonna talk about fair use. We're going to go through those a few cases and then talk about how it applies to libraries. And we should have plenty of time uh, for questions. Um, and I know that there, uh, the folks at uh, ACRL are going to um, track some of the questions. If you guys think of questions, feel free to put those in the chat boxes, but we'll have plenty of time, as I said, at the end to go through questions that you guys might have. So copyright, uh, the quick version is that it's original works of authorship fixed in a tangible means of expression. So this presentation that we're doing, the PowerPoint presentation is something that could have, power, uh, that could have copyright protection. The recording of this presentation is something that could have copyright protection. If you all were sitting in a room with me and I was just talking to you about copyright, that would not have copyright protection because it's not fixed in a tangible means of expression. So someone doing a performance of a song, the song itself, if it's written down somewhere or recorded somewhere, that could have copyright protection, but someone singing and it's not captured in any way would not have copyright protection. So the exclusive rights that are available to um, creators of copyrightable materials, they have the right to reproduce or make copies of their works, to make derivative works, so to turn their poem into a song, their book into a movie. They have the right to distribute that work, to publicly display and perform that work, and to publicly perform um, a sound recording via digital audio transmission. So these are all the rights that creators have in the works that they create. And as you can see in the image, um, the image shows books, CDs, DVDs, um, software, all different types of things that are meant to show a floor of things that have, could have copyright protection. It's not, by no means meant to be a ceiling of things that could have copyright protection. In the United States, copyright is about balance. So, it is intended to be a balance between creators and users of content. So it, it's meant that, you know, if, if we had as creators, we made things and we were the only ones who could have the rights to access it, it would hinder innovation because no one could use our works or be inspired by our works to make other types of material. So in the United States, it's intended that copyright be a balance between rights holders and between users of content. 
And in academia, we know that copying is good for research and scholarship because we, in specific fields, we might need to copy something in order to critique it, in order to comment on it, in order to um, make it available for other people to also have a way in and be able to consider um, what is happening with that material. So copying can be good and can be useful, especially in academia. Now we place limitations on what can be protected in the United States by the length of protection and for certain types of use of material. We do that because we want people to be able to exploit and make money off of the things that they create. So as a creator of content, you should be able to sell it, copy it, do all types of things for it, or authorize other people to make copies of the, the item or material and make money off of it. But then your rights, um, will go away and then the rest of the public will be able to make use of that once that material no longer has copyright protection, which will, and then, will then spur creativity and spur innovation with other people who are able to make use of the, the material that you create. So fair use really goes to kind of <clears throat> explore that, that balance that I was just talking about Fair use of a copyrighted work for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, including multiple copies for classroom use, scholarship, or research is not considered an infringement of copyright. So this, what I read to you just now, is from Section 107, which is the fair use um, section of U.S. copyright law. And, and what it's essentially saying is if you, using copyrighted works or works that are still under copyright protection, you um, are using it for these purposes, then it's not an infringement of copyright. So you are able to make those uses and make an argument that you're using it for fair use. Fair use has a four factor analysis and all of the factors are important. This image uh, is a, uh, has five circles, fair use is in the center and the other circles are the four factors which are the, the purpose. So what are you using this material for? What is it that you're trying to do? Is it educational? Is it commercial? Is it um, to illustrate a point? What is it that you're using this material for? And then nature of the material. <clears throat> what kind of work is it? Fictional, non-fiction? Um, is it something, uh, and then, the next one is the amount. How much are you using of this content? Is it something that could be considered the heart of the work? Is it like the most important part of the work that you're using in this material? And then the last factor is the effect, the market effect. Is there a possible effect for or harm for the original creator of the works that you're using if you use the work in a certain way? So could you have an impact on their ability to make money or exploit their items because of how you're using the content. So the fair use checklist, which many of you may be familiar with, was created by Kenny Cruz when he was at Columbia University. And uh, Kenny Cruz uses this checklist and he is pulling in cases and case law to develop this checklist for people to go through as they are working through and wanting to use other, per, other people's content to try to see if they can make a fair use analysis. So when you're looking at, let's say for example, there's an image um, showing purpose. So favoring fair use has teaching, research, scholarship, and then under purpose, opposing fair use, commercial activity, uh, uh, profiting from the use, entertainment, bad faith behavior, I show, are shown as opposing fair use. And so um, I put a link into the chat box, which goes to um, the Health Sciences Library here at OSU created an app that has a, a fair use checklist, which you can go through and test out um, how you are trying to make or how you could make a fair use argument for a material that you want to use. So now we're going to move into the fair use cases. For these cases, I selected, uh, we selected um, 
cases that were at the circuit court level and the Supreme Court level. And the reason why we selected circuit court and Supreme Court cases is, as everyone knows, Supreme Court is the highest court. So if a decision is made there, that is definitively what fair use is. At circuit court, that is the, the level below um, the Supreme Court. And a lot of times that is where a lot where a number of cases end up and they don't go on to the Supreme Court because the Supreme Court doesn't take every case. And so that is what stands for that particular circuit. And it does give us information about what courts are considering to be fair use or not. So we still get information even when it's not something that's from the Supreme Court. So we have four cases that we're going to talk about today. And as I mentioned earlier, we're going to go through, we're using the cases to illustrate maybe a particular factor, but we're going to go through each of the factors that the court considered in each of the cases. So we'll start off with factor one, which is purpose, which deals with transformative use. And where the first case we're gonna talk about is Cairo v. Prince. And I'm gonna turn it over to Maria. Okay, so uh, this is an interesting case. Um, it involves a photographer, uh, Patrick Cario, who published a number um, of his photographs of Rastafarians and his book, uh, Yes Rasta. So what you see on the screen are some examples of his photographs, uh, Patrick Carey's photographs on the left. Um, and then Richard Prince is an appropriation artist. And he came across a copy of Yes Rasta uh, and decided to take some of the photographs and then create some new works uh, using those photographs. So uh, the image that you see on the right side of the screen is one example of um, the many works uh, that Richard Prince created as part of this series, uh, which was called the Canal Zone uh, series. So the U.S. Rasta book um, was published by Patrick Carew, and it had some limited commercial success. So it was sold. Um, around 6,000 copies were sold. Uh, but except for a few private deals uh, to some known acquaintances, Patrick Carew didn't actually license um, any individual photographs. So um, Richard Prince came across uh, Yes Rasta and decided to create some new works using those photographs. Um, and ultimately the works that he created were exhibited uh, in a couple of different exhibits. Um, and he used these photographs in different ways. So you see one example on the screen um, but he made some changes to the original photographs. Uh, in some cases, he was using large portions of the photographs. Um, in some cases, he was um, overlaying some lozenges over people's faces. Uh, there was a blue tint uh, to Richard Prince's work. Uh, what you can't see here on the screen is that Richard's, uh, Richard Prince's collages were actually much larger versions uh, of the photographs. So these works were exhibited. Um, there was also a, an exhibition, uh, a catalog that was also sold, including some of these works. Um, and in total, Richard Prince owned um, a little over $10 million um, for works in this exhibit. So this was a case where uh, Patrick Carew um, brought a case for copyright infringement. And the court then had to consider the question of, uh, does this qualify as a fair use? So in this case, uh, the reason we, we picked this case uh, to illustrate purpose and character is this case really dives into the question of what it means to be transformative. So um, when courts talk about transformative in the context of fair use, uh, what they're looking at is whether a new work um, either supersedes the object or instead adds something new. Uh, so it gives the work a new expression, a new meaning or a new message. It's that adding something new, uh, which can qualify as a transformative use of the work. So in this case, the court found that um, Richard Prince's uh, works were highly transformative. Uh, so they said if you put these works side by side, a reasonable observer would look at Patrick Curie's photographs and they would get uh, or pull from that serene, 
deliberately composed photographs. Um, they were designed to depict the natural beauty of the Rastafarian people in their environment. Compare that to Richard Prince's uh, work uh, that the court describes as crude and jarring, uh, hectic and provocative. So when you look at these works side by side, um, the takeaway is that they're providing a new expression, a new aesthetic. Um, and so as a result, the court says that's highly transformative. The other, um, the other issue that courts will consider under this first factor is whether the work is being used for commercial purpose or for nonprofit educational purposes. Uh, so in this case, there wasn't any real question that this was being used for a commercial context, but because the uses were so highly transformative, uh, the court just didn't uh, put as much weight into the fact that Richard Prince was selling uh, these works or using for commercial purpose. Uh, so that's the first factor. And then the second factor is the nature of the copyrighted work. So looking to whether the work is expressive or creative, in which case courts will be more protective under fair use. Uh, and also considering whether the work was published or unpublished. So the scope of fair use um, for unpublished works is uh, considerably narrower. So in this case, there wasn't any dispute that uh, uh, Kara Yu's photographs were creative works. Uh, but again, the court here didn't give as much weight to this factor because the use was really transformative. Um, so what you see in this case and what you'll see in other cases is um, the factors aren't viewed in isolation. There's definitely an interplay between all of these factors. Uh, in this case, the fact that it was found to be transformative will kind of carry through uh, and impact the remaining factors. Uh, so that was the nature. Third factor is the amount and substantiality of the portion used. Um, so what you see on your screen is one example from this exhibit. This lawsuit involved a total of 30 works. So some of the works involved uh, larger portions of photographs. Um, some included um, photographs that were pretty heavily obscured. Um, in other cases, they were barely altered. But for many of the works, the court concluded that the amount of the work that was taken was reasonable given the, given the transformative purpose. Um, so in this case, it's, it's not a, a bright line rule of how much is okay or not okay, but really what is reasonable in relationship to the stated purpose uh, for using the work. And then the last factor here is market effect. And when courts are considering market effect, for fair use, uh, what they are really looking at in most cases is whether the secondary use um, serves as a market substitute for the original work. So does it usurp the original work? Um, and in this case, uh, the court said, no, uh, that's not happening. And the reason it's not happening is because they had found the use to be so transformative that the result is that the audience for these two works were two different audiences. So you're dealing with two different markets. So you're not dealing with the issue of market substitution. Uh, so overall, uh, the court balances all of these uh, factors together and they determine um, that this is a fair use. All right, so for the, <clears throat> the next case, to factor two, <clears throat> the nature of the material. And the case that we decided to, to look at today is Harper and Row versus Nation Enterprises, which is a Supreme Court case from 1985. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so some of you might be familiar with the autobiography of Gerald R. Ford and um, A Time to Heal. And it, it was uh, published by Harper and Rowe. And prior to the release of the book, they had uh, arranged a deal with Time Magazine to, do, to, to provide certain excerpts through Time. And they were planning to do that rollout through Time Magazine and some other um, obviously carefully planned marketing 
to uh, increase sales of their book. So somehow the nation was able to get a copy of the book and they ended up preempting the Time Magazine production of the excerpts from the book. And they, were, they put those in their magazine before Time had an opportunity to put it out. And so <clears throat> Harper and Rowe brought a lawsuit against the nation. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry. The purpose and character in this case weighed against fair use because the nation um, was not merely using an incidental effect, but the intended purpose was to um, supplant the copyright holders commercially valuable right of first publication. So the, as a publisher, Harper and Rowe had um, given rights to Time Magazine to do these excerpts and additionally they were the publisher of the book. And so they were, they had their plan of how they wanted to get the word out about this and it didn't include the Nation Magazine. And so the court ruled that the Nation's intent to benefit deprived the copyright holders of the first right of publication and therefore under the first factor, it was not a fair use. Um, under the second factor, which is where we, where we highlighted, we're talking about the nature of the work. Um, and as we talked about before, the nature, the nature of the work um, deals a lot with whether something is factual um, or non-factual, fiction, non-fiction, and so here, even though it was primarily informative or factual, <clears throat> which means there could be less copyright protection, the work had a lot of expressive value. So if the nation had really, had only maintained dealing with facts, which we all have access to the facts of what happened with Ford um, and Nixon, they would have, it would have been, they would have been able to, to probably go ahead and go with this. But what they did was they used a lot of the expressive content from the autobiography in their work. So um, the nation did not stop at isolated phrases and instead excerpted subjective descriptions and portraits of public figures whose power lies in the author's individualized expression. So that's something that the court um, talked about and expressly stated that because they didn't just rely on the facts, they actually used what um, Gerald Ford as a part of his autobiography, how he expressed himself in talking about these, these people and these incidents, that that is what made it um, not a fair use under the second factor. So it was factual, but they used the expressive um, nature of the content as expressed by President Ford. For under the third factor, under the amount and substantial substantiality of the portion used uh, in relation to the copyrighted work, this again weighed against uh, fair use for, for the nation because what they used, what they decided to utilize in their article on the book was essentially, you know, if someone's getting a book about Gerald Ford, yes, they might be interested in his life and his presidency, et cetera, but many people are probably most interested in why he pardoned Nixon. And so what they use at, what the nation used in their article was to talk about what, 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 that, what those reasons were. And because of that, the court said, you're using the heart of the work. Um, the court noted that an infringer could not defend plagiarism by pointing out how much they could have plagiarized, but did not. So they kind of tried to talk about that they didn't take everything, they just took a, a part, a, a small part, but the court said the part that you took is like the main part that people would tune in, people would buy the book to find out. And so you have you know, taken away that, that ability from the publisher to be able to have that heart of the work be something that they controlled and they have, they have made available as they wanted to. And then with the fourth factor, the market effect, um, the court found that this, this also weighed against the finding of fair use for the nation because um, the nation, in fact, scooped Time Magazine, <clears throat> which was an arrangement that Harper and Rowe had put together themselves. And so that did have implications because obviously if the nation had already put this out, Time Magazine had no interest in publishing that content. So then that, that led to an actual harm to um, Harper and Rowe that could be that could be easily uh, made available to the courts and the, the court could easily see. 
So they canceled the publishing contract and they didn't go forward with that deal. And so this finding was on all four factors, was not fair use. Um, the, the nation tried to make a claim of fair use. The court found that there was no fair use on any of the factors. And so it was decided for Harper and Rowe. Okay, so this next case, um, Bill Graham Archives uh, versus Dorling Kindersley. Um, this is a case um, also involving a book. Uh, in 2003, Dorling Kindersley, or DK, um, published the book Grateful Dead, The Illustrated Trip, which is a chronological history of the Grateful Dead. Uh, what you see on the screen is an example of one of those pages. So um, the image up top, um, is a poster uh, and um, a sample of uh, the way that this was laid out in the book um, is seen below. So this is a um, typical page of this 480 page coffee book, um, includes collage of text, images, and graphic art. And within that book were seven images that were owned by Bill Graham archives, uh, images that originally appeared on concert posters and uh, concert tickets for the Grateful Dead. Um, so in this case, um, uh, DK uh, did initially reach out to secure permission to use the images. Uh, they couldn't, the parties couldn't figure out or couldn't settle on a, an appropriate license fee. So um, they went forward, DK went forward and publishing the book uh, without a license in place. Um, and then this brought, um, brought up a claim of copyright infringement. So again, the court has to consider um, what is the fair use here. Um, so in this case, uh, when the court is looking to the purpose and the character of the use, they are again considering this uh, use and whether it's commercial or nonprofit, they're also considering this transformative piece again. And the court here said that in this case, the use of the concert images um, in the book was a transformative use. So the original images had served uh, two purposes, uh, artistic expression and promotion, and they were circulated to generate public interest in the band and in the concerts. Um, by contrast, when those images were pulled into the book, um, they were serving a different purpose, which was uh, as historical artifacts. So they were there to document and to represent the occurrences of the concerts. Um, and they were serving as um, historic scholarship. So there were um, the images that were included, they were paired with captions, they were um, placed along a timeline. And all of these decisions then strengthen an argument that the was transformative. Um, the court also said that even though the book was a commercial venture, so it was sold, um, they did draw the line here and they said the actual images that were in question in this case, um, they're being used um, in a way that's incidental to the commercial biographical value of the book. So um, in other words, the court's saying here that the images are used um, in a book that's being sold, but the images are not being used in a way to promote the sale of that book. Um, and so the court here was saying, uh, this is a, an example of a transformative use. There's less weight on the commercial nature. And so this factor uh, weighs in favor of fair use. For the second factor, looking to the nature of the copyrighted work, um, the original images are highly creative images. Uh, so typically that would weigh against fair use. Um, but this is again, another case where uh, because um, the use in the book was a transformative use, there's less weight put on this factor, uh, the nature of the copyrighted work. And then the third factor is the amount and substantiality of the portion used. And um, as in the earlier case with you, it's looking to how much are you using of the work and is that reasonable when you consider the transformative purpose. Um, so in this case, the images, um, the entire image was used. 
um, but the images were reduced in size. And by reducing them in size and by pairing them with this timeline and intermingle, intermingling them with text, it really reduced the visual impact, the original artistic expression of the work. And it helped to ensure that the readers are, are seeing these images and recognizing them as historical <coughs> artifacts. So even though the entire image was used in this case, the court once again found that it, it very much aligns with the transformative purpose. And then the last um, factor here is market effect. Um, again, thinking about market substitution. So does the um, secondary use usurp the original work? Does it serve as a market substitute for the original work? Um, in this case, the parties had agreed that there wasn't any impact on the primary market. So uh, the use of the images in the book didn't affect the sale of posters, um, but the court has to look beyond the primary mar market and also consider derivative markets. Um, so what kind of effect would this have on potential licensing revenue um, for the rights holders? Um, this is a case like the Carrie case where because the use was transformative, the court here says that there are different markets uh, involved, different markets at play. So as a result, the court found that there wasn't market harm um, due to the loss of potential license fees because there wasn't that market substitution that was happening. Um, in this case, I think is also a, a good case to illustrate because the parties were willing and had started that conversation, that negotiation uh, for a licensing fee, they never got there. But the fact that they were willing to um, pay a licensing fee, it did not preclude them from being able to rely on fair use uh, based on a balancing of all of the factors. Uh, so overall, uh, the court said that this was a fair use. Okay, and for our next um, and final case, we're looking at Campbell v. A. Cup Rose Music, Supreme Court case from 1994. And um, the images are of Roy Orbison's uh, album cover for Oh Pretty Woman. And then the second image is for Two Live Crew um, and uh, the uh, album on which their version of Oh Pretty Woman uh, was on, and it's a, a cover of that album as well, so, um, which I won't describe, um, so, yeah. Anyway, uh, so, uh, Luther Campbell is a part of Two Live Crew, which is a Miami-based group uh, from the late 80s, early 90s, I think a little bit into the 2000s, um, went by the moniker Uncle Luke, and uh, so he and Two Live Crew heard Oh Pretty Woman and they decided that they wanted to do a, a parody version of Oh Pretty Woman in their style of music, which again is Miami based. Um, so rap music uh, also in there too. And so they wanted to do their own version and they reached out to uh, A Cuff Rose music label and asked for a license. They were denied a license because of who Two Live Crew is, and if you're familiar, you might know why they were refused the license. Um, and they decided that they would go forth anyway and make their version of Oh Pretty Woman. So um, this case went through the courts. It got uh, to circuit court and then made its way to the Supreme Court. And um, it is one of my favorite cases. <laughs> Uh, so going through the Supreme Court um, decided uh, that this is one of the cases where they talked about the factors must be applied in each in each situation on a case by case basis. So um, a lot of times when people are talking to us about fair use, like we'll say it depends and we don't mean that to kind of brush people off, but it really does depend. And it depends is a good answer because the courts themselves will say each case is different and we need to look at each case 
um, in a unique way and go through the four factor analysis each time. So when looking at the purpose and character of Two Live Crew's use of Oh Pretty Woman, the court found that uh, this work was transformative. Um, it, the original song is a ballad. Um, the, the version done by Two Live Crew is not. Um, and the court found that because of how transformative this new work is, that, they're, that they would place less significance on the other three factors. Um, in this particular instance. The court found that the work's commercial nature, so Two Live Crew obviously sold their version as well as, um, as did Roy Orbison, um, that that is only one element and that that would not preclude their being able to make a, a use of this work under fair use. Um, under factor two, uh, actually, they, they found that there, there wasn't really a lot to weigh in on here because it's, both versions are um, creative and artistic in nature. And so because it's because the second version, the version by Two Live Crew is meant to be a parody, it actually, they need to have there be a, another creative version that relies on, their, their parody relies on the fact that this is a creative and known version. So um, that they, uh, Justice Souter talked about the fact that this really doesn't have any, there's no resolution with number, two, with number two in this particular instance. Um, on the third factor, uh, there was, the third factor found that this was very an important factor with the amount of what was copied. So in a lower court, they uh, reversed on this particular holding because the lower court said that Two Live Crew excessively copied from the original. The Supreme Court and Justice Souter said that the amount used was reasonable because in creating a parody, you have to use enough that people recognize what the original was in order for the parody to work. So you can't um, not use the amount that's needed. You have to use the amount that's needed to make sure people recognize what it is that you're making fun of, essentially, is what the court said. Um, and the court, and I'm quoting here, said, even if two live, two live crews copying of the original's first line of lyrics and characteristics, opening base riff may be used, said to go, to go to the original's heart of the work, the heart is most readily conjures up the song for the parody. And, the, and it is the heart of the work at which the parody takes aim. So when looking at that, the court said they had to use that amount. They had to use, you know, maybe more than was needed in order to make their point under a parody. And then with the final factor, which is what we have it under here with market effect, the court said that um, in this case, parodies will rarely substitute for the original. So Maria earlier, earlier talked about um, market effect often being um, whether something might substitute for the original. In this case, the court said, no one's going to confuse Two Live Crew's version with Roy Orbison's version. They are looking at two different markets and they are going towards two different audiences. And so that there was no uh, harm of confusion between those two, those two instances. Um, so this case, you know, went to the Supreme Court and on the majority of the factors found that that was uh, fair use. So, you know, that was the, the last case that we were going to talk about today. Um, but yeah, so we, well, the reason why we brought these cases up and what, where we want to go and next is thinking about what does this mean for libraries. So we talked about four different cases, went through step-by-step um, -step analysis using the four-factor test. And essentially what we want you all to take away from this is to kind of do some myth busting. So a lot of times when people come and talk to us, they'll talk to us about, um, you know, I'm only going to use 10% or I'm only using six seconds of something or, you know, that, that, those kinds of things, which may be a community of practice. It may be something that they've heard you know, what, what have you, but there, there are no percentages that are laid out in the law. The law doesn't have anything about a percentage or an amount of time. And as you can see from these various cases, there are instances where the entire work was used, where a portion of the work was used, and there were different um, outcomes 
uh, based on the, the court's analysis of the entire four factors. The other thing, the other myths that we want to kind of bust through is um, edu educational use equals automatically equals fair use. It could, but it's not automatic that just because you're using it in an educational setting or you're using it for educational purpose, that that means that there is fair use. The really big one is that uh, commercial use precludes fair use. So as we noted in several of these cases, the, the person using the content and trying to make a fair use case was often using it for a commercial purpose. And just because they were using it for a commercial purpose, the courts have said that doesn't, that doesn't mean that they cannot use and they cannot rely on fair use. And then any uses that you make are transformative. Um, I often get a lot of arguments with people saying that, oh, well, I'm using it for, I'm putting it in the learning management system. So that's a different use. And often those things that they're putting into the learning management system are journal articles, which are meant to be read and meant for educational purposes. So that putting it in a, into a, a learning management system is not necessarily transformative. Um, and as you can see from some of the cases that we talked about today, the courts are really looking for uh, a true transformation, using it in a totally different and new way, an innovative way. Socially useful does not automatically mean fair use. So uh, just because there'll be social benefits to something that you're trying to do does not mean that you can say that it's just fair use. It could be, but you would really need to work through the all four factors to, to make sure that you have a good case for fair use. And then the last one we wanna talk about today is that um, no fair use, there's no fair use when a permission scheme exists. And in at least two of the cases that we talked about today, there was a permission scheme that, that existed or an ability to get permission for material that didn't work out and they still were able to make a case for fair use. So just because there's an ability to pay to be able to use something doesn't mean that you can't make a fair use case. So in trying to make the case for fair use, you want to think about all four of the factors and we, we definitely hope that we've illustrated how the courts actually go through and they go through all four of the factors and they may, may determine that one is not as important as the other three or the other three are less important than one. They may decide, you know, that they're kind of doing a balancing between the factors, but they do go through each and every factor to determine whether or not one can have a case for or against fair use. So, <clears throat> Here are all the things that we talked about in these particular cases and earlier. Purpose with, is it an educational commercial use, nature, fiction, nonfiction, um, amount, how much of the work are you using? Is that amount, does that include the heart of the work? And then market effect, does the use harm a potential market for the creator? Here are a few examples um, of where we see people relying on fair use in higher education. So student projects, um, putting things into learning management systems, digitization projects, um, content that goes into scholarly articles, books, theses and dissertations, and making materials available for persons with disabilities. So there are a lot of different ways that we can get into and approach fair use. Um, we, we, what we want people to take away from this is to think about the ways case law help you build cases to do this kind of work and to make content more available to people, uh, to the patrons that are coming to your library. So with that, we are at the end of our presentation and we'd like to open it up for questions if um, folks have questions for us. Great, thanks. And while people are um, typing additional questions in the chat, I have a couple that have come in throughout the presentation um, that I'll just um, start with the first question that kind of came in when you guys were discussing factor one. It was a question from Miriam who was asking um, whether Prince needed to attribute his work to the original artist. Uh, so attribution is not a factor that's considered as part of the four fair use factors. Um, so providing attribution is certainly something that you do as part of a norm. 
um, or as part of you know, an academic discipline or expectation. Um, courts don't view that as a demonstration of good faith. Um, there are some courts that have looked to um, lack of attribution potentially as a demonstration of bad faith. Um, so not all courts consider that, um, but attribution is something you wanna do, um, but is not required by copyright law. He probably should have done it. <laughs> But it, it wouldn't have it wouldn't have hurt him to do it, but it was not required. Thanks. And that sort of relates to um, a sec another question we have here from Rona um, asking, did DK attribute the images to the Bill Graham archives? And then do courts ever take this into account? Yes, yeah, so I'm not sure um, if they did it, if they provided attribution in the book itself. Um, though there was early discussion, as I mentioned, between both of the parties of trying to figure out um, how to license, how to mutually uh, license and agree upon the use of the work. Um, so at one point in time, there did seem to be um, a relationship and um, communication that was ongoing. Though I don't know if they, in the end, did provide attribution uh, to the archive. And we have a question from Moriana asking, how about repeated use of an article or book chapter in multiple instances in a course? Is there anything, sorry, the, the text box jumped. Um, is there anything in case law about that? So I don't know off the top of my head if there's a case that speaks specifically about it, but cases do say over and over from the Supreme Court down to the district courts that, um, Fair use is determined on a case-by-case -case basis. So um, anytime there's an opportunity um, that you may be using a work in a slightly different way, a slightly different manner, um, a different portion of the work, um, that can shift your fair use analysis. Um, and so you should be rethinking a fair use analysis. And um, here's a question. Uh, we're moving away from having DVD players in the classroom. If we own the DVD, is it permissible for us to convert the DVD ourselves to a streaming format so teachers can continue to have access? <laughs> okay, so um, the question is, converting the DVD that you own to a streaming copy to make available in classrooms during, for classroom use, right? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Okay, um, so there are a couple things that are happening here. So in order to make this streaming copy, you have to break DRM, which is a violation of um, the, the contract that you're under in having the access to the DVD. And then you're also making a copy that you're posting and then providing out. Now you can try and make a fair use analysis um, for this, but I, I think that for me, um, the fair use case there is extremely, um, it's not, it's not a good fair use case in, in my mind. I do understand the issues with having DVDs and people are now DVD players are not being used as much and wanting to still provide this content, but there, there isn't a, a solution that really works right now. And fair use, I don't think, gives you the protection that, that is needed to be able to, to, to make the case to do that. Yeah. Um, some places where there might be some help would be uh, looking at section 110, which allows for portions of work to be um, made available and streamed. But um, I think that there's a, there isn't a great fair use case to be able to break DRM and make a copy and stream something. Now, there are other um, 
copyright folks across the nation who might disagree with me. Maybe if you talk to your um, uh, your university's council and see what their thoughts are, they might give you a different opinion. But for me, I think it's it's a little it's not a great fair use case in my opinion. Yeah, I'll agree. Um, I think it can be tricky um, because as we mentioned already, fair use is a case by case analysis. So uh, when you're thinking about digitizing and sharing um, those videos, those films, um, you do have to be sensitive to the individual nature of each work that you're working with. So it may be, you know, in one case, you're working with um, a work that's out of print. Um, the fair use analysis for that is going to be very different than a DVD from Disney. Um, so it is thinking about individually um, working through those, those four factors for each individual title uh, that you would be considering to digitize and make available. Uh, but then as Sandra mentioned, there are other exceptions in the law um, that could potentially get you um, to where you might want to be in terms of providing access uh, to works. But, you know, fair use changes, how we uh, think about fair use changes as courts hear more cases. So it could very much be the case, you know, as this becomes a growing trend or a bigger demand that we'll see fair use case law kind of evolve a little bit to be more responsive uh, to those needs. And, um, you know, coming from the libraries, you should definitely check and see if your library has access to this content either through some stre streaming platforms that they might be subscribers to. Um, you can also, if in the case where um, Maria is describing it's something that's out of print, um, you could also consider maybe contacting the, um, the publisher or the distributor to see if they would allow you to make a streaming version. Um, these are, you know, obviously that's not relying on fair use. Neither of those are relying on fair use, but um, th this is a way to maybe get what it is that you might need in that particular instance. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question here from Tiffany who is asking if a student disbounds a book and for use in an academic library exhibit that includes original artwork with pages from the book, is this fair use? Any recommendations for asking these questions, for example, law firms that specialize in this area? Wait, they, they took the book apart and put the works up in, uh, for a display? believe so, but hopefully Tiffany can chime in in the chat. Yes. Uh, she said yes, took the book apart and combined it with original artwork. So that's an interesting situation. Um, so fair use comes into play because it, um, it's uh, an exception or a right uh, check on the exclusive rights of a copyright owner. Um, so display is one of those rights. However, um, there is a part of a, a different exception that allows you to display the particular copy of a work that you have. Um, and so the act of displaying the book, the actual book um, may not actually be an issue. Um, if the books were copied um, or reproduced or in some other way as part of sharing that and is um, they're combining it with other artwork. I think it goes back to this, the cases that we discussed of um, really thinking about the purpose and the character of the use. So what exactly is this student doing with the work? Um, is it just kind of the same purpose of entertainment? Is there some sort of commentary or criticism going on? Um, is the final work something new and something transformative? Um, if that's the case, then potentially there, there would be uh, an argument uh, for fair use. Part of that is also considering where that final product lives, how it's shared, how much is being used, um, all of that would matter.
think. So we have about five more minutes left. We'll see how many more questions um, we can get through. Um, we have a question from Ben who's asked, how do you weigh giving copyright guidance versus not giving legal advice? Do you ever say that's probably okay? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> um, the way we, we kind of go is we provide information we provide resources um but we aren't telling people what they should do so um i look at legal advice as here's what you should do and this is how you move forward and what we do instead is we provide a lot of different information a lot of different pieces of information a lot of different scenarios and let them make the decision on how they want to move forward um, and you know, most of it, most of the time is based on copyright law. It's based on cases that we're familiar with, what we're providing and, and letting them make the decision for themselves on how they want to move forward. Yeah, so I think that's um, why it's really great to be aware of cases um, and to be able to share that information. So very often, if I'm working with faculty or staff or students involving fair use questions, if uh, they present a scenario that sounds pretty similar to a case, um, I can just direct to that case and say, well, this is how one court um, has kind of parsed through those issues. Um, the other thing is there are a lot of resources online to kind of guide through that. So Sandra mentioned the fair use checklist, which is um, just a very valuable resource in thinking about fair use. Um, and I will say that personally, another resource that's been very helpful when I'm speaking with faculty um, or staff about fair use issues is um, through the US Copyright Office, they have a fair use index, which provides very short summaries of fair use cases, uh, old and new. And so it can be a really good resource for kind of getting a feel for how courts tackle different uses of copyrighted works. So not providing legal advice and not serving as um, judge or, or jury of the case, but really letting the case law speak for itself. Great. Thank you. We'll see if we can get a couple more questions in. Um, we have a question from Michael who is I'm asking if you can digitize a copyrighted image for classroom use, but not put it in a learning management system. Digit digitize it so you can display it in the, cl in the classroom. If that's the case, um, there is a, not, not necessarily under fair use, although you could probably make an argument for making the copy to, for fair use, make an art fair use argument to make a copy. But to display it in class in the classroom, in a physical classroom, face-to-face -face teaching, there's an exception under Section 110 that allows for face-to-face -face teaching the display of copyrighted work. So you would be able to, to rely on that to do that. Um. We have a question from Amber who, is asked, who says, a faculty member has a copy of a journal article that our library does not have access to, and he wants to upload it in the course management system. Access would be limited to the students enrolled in that course. Would this be fair use? So the answer is it depends. <laughs> um, so it's, uh, in, you know, you have to go through the fair use factor. You have to think about all of the factors together. Um, so we've dealt with this situation before where we don't have the ability to simply direct to um, a database. Um, and in that case, um, very often the conversation that we have with faculty members is, um, why are you sharing this article? Is it really tied to specific teaching objectives or is this kind of extra reading uh, that you're assigning to students. So making sure that there is that connection there with the educational purpose. And then also thinking about how much of that article is necessary to achieve that purpose. So if the faculty member maybe 
doesn't need the whole article, um, only sharing the portion that's needed. Um, and also giving some consideration to um, when they make that available, for how long they make it available, um, and again, providing some of that contextual information. So that commentary, that criticism, uh, to make sure that it's aligned with the teaching objective. Thank you. And I see we're about at the top of the hour, so it's probably time for us to start wrapping things up. Um, I did see a question in the chat wondering about the recording, um, which we will email out um, to everyone in the next day or so, and we'll also make available um, online, and we'll link out to that. Um, ACRL has a number of other resources available this week um, as part of Fair Use Fair Dealing Week. So um, please follow along our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram channels. Um, for other activities that we're doing um, to celebrate the week. And thank you, Sandra and Maria, for your time today. Um, we really appreciate your presentation. There was some great information shared. So thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. It was great uh, talking with you guys.